Excellent, we're live. So um, welcome to this session, everybody. This is um, an action workshop session, and um, you're in the room for social enterprises in the climate emergency, which is going to be led by Jess Holliland from the Plymouth Social Enterprise Network. So we're going to hear today about how social enterprises are approaching zero carbon and what we can learn from their attitudes to this important change. So we're going to hear lots about different local enterprises and how they're putting change into action in their everyday business. But it's also an inter interactive workshop. So Jess will be posing some questions and inviting you to think about your own organisations and how you can make more impact moving forwards. So without any further ado, I shall hand over to Jess and um, we look forward to hearing more about, about this important topic. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Will. Um, thanks very much. It's really lovely. Um, just to say a little bit about who I am. So I'm Jess Hollyland. I work uh, for the Plymouth Social Enterprise Network. Uh, I also work with social enterprises across the Southwest as part of the School for Social Entrepreneurs team. Um, I'm super passionate about sustainability and making sure that we reduce our impact on the world. So this is a really important workshop for me. And I strongly believe that the best way for us to all have an impact is to all try and have an impact and to make it as accessible as possible. So really that's what I'm gonna be looking at today. I'm gonna to be encouraging you to think of how you can really embed these changes in your everyday doing, in your everyday business. Um, and yeah, just go from there, bear with me, I'm making my slides work. Um, so I'm not here to give you all the answers. I'm just here to encourage you to ask questions and I'm also going to share with you some of the ways that local social enterprises are already approaching this in hope that that gives you some reassurance and some inspiration um, and, and that you feel empowered to take a next step. Uh, the climate emergency itself is a huge, huge thing, but it was created by um, big and small behaviours. And I sincerely believe that it's big and small changes that we need to make in order to start reversing some of that damage and to help put our planet back in a better place. Um, so yeah, that's what we're gonna do today. Think about small changes which add up to bigger impacts. I did a small survey of some of our members uh, in anticipation of this workshop. Um, and it was really interesting. I asked them whether or not their main impact, because social enterprises are businesses who have an aim and a charitable aim, which is based on people or planet. Um, and I asked them how many of them had an ecological and an environmental impact as their primary aim. And it was interesting that it came back about 50-50. But what I also went on to ask them was how embedded sustainability was in their day-to-day -day practice. And that figure was much, much higher. And that is reflected nationally as we work. So this is a statistic from the State of the Sector Survey, the most recent one by Social Enterprise UK, um, which showed that 88% of the social enterprises they surveyed across the entirety of the United Kingdom aimed to minimise their environmental impact, which is significantly higher than the same statistics coming back from uh, the more traditional business surveys. Um, and 65% of them, as you can see, they were expecting to increase their focus on sustainability. And they considered that the environment, environmental impact was equal or greater importance than the cost. So what they were buying, they didn't just think about how many pennies it was. They really factored in what the impact of that item was in their day to day and what they were doing. And it's. I mean, we say that social enterprises, we have to have a cause, which is people or planet. But we all know, we all know very, very well that without any planet, there are no people. So social enterprises get that. And, and that is why they embed and they embrace to such a degree why they pull everything together. So is it? What I really want to get across to you today, 
how social enterprises approach this and how important it is to everything they do. There is no tokenism. We, we see a lot of tokenism and it's very depressing, I think. It's very depressing. We're, we're gonna put a green flag on something because it's litter picking week. We're gonna donate, you know, one day a year of our team's times in order to go and do a local community litter pick. And it's not good enough because the rest of the time they're making terrible decisions with polystyrene cups and no interest in the carbon footprint of the items that they're using, that they're recruiting, no interest in the process in the day to day. And it's not good enough. And we just don't see that as much in social enterprises. Of course, there are some first to admit there always will be. Um, and the bigger a company gets, the harder it is to wrangle those tiny decisions. But generally speaking, social enterprises understand that it's the day to day changes and the choices that they make that have an impact on the world around them, whether that's people or planet. So I'm here today to ask you really to think about how we make sustainability a no brainer. How do we embed it so deeply in our practices, in our processes, in our day to day life that we don't even have to think about it anymore? It's like brushing your teeth when you get up in the morning. It's like breathing. How do we do that? How do we find because it won't work instantly. It won't happen straight away. It has to be a practice that we get into. So how do we start that practice? So I've got a question for you now, and I'd love you to pop the answers to this in the chat. We've got somebody monitoring that for you. That's um, I really like you to share with each other and, and be bold and be brave and ask yourself if you were to score yourself one to five on how highly you prioritize uh, environmental impact in your day to day business decisions, where would you put yourself right now? So one is being. I don't think about it at all, it's not important. And five being, it's absolutely integral to every decision that we make. So I'd really like you to just take a minute and do that for me now, if you can. And I want you to be honest while you're doing it. You know, I mean, we're all busy. We can't do everything all the time and sometimes other things take priorities but I want you to be honest um, because that's how we start to grow when we start from a space of honesty and, and think wide as well I mean I'm not just talking about an energy supplier or a polystyrene cup I'm talking about how your team get to work I'm talking about whether you use recycled rainwater. I'm talking about, do you have a recycling bin in your office or does everything go into the same bin? What, what are you doing right now and how important is it when you make those decisions? Well, in the survey that I did of local members, um, they told me roughly 55% of them put themselves at a number four. So it is really, really important to them in their everyday decision. They think about it hard. 33% um, of them place themselves at a five. So it's doable. That's what I want you to take from that. It, it's not a brag. It's not a we're doing this. Why aren't you? It's, a, it's an achievable. It's me trying to show you that there are companies out there, small companies, medium sized companies who are already embedding this in their day to day. They are thinking about the little things, how they add up. And I want you to, to remember that it's doing things that are achievable that will create practical change for you as you move forward. Uh, and, and all of that said, I mean, it has to be acknowledged that they aren't perfect and they acknowledge that themselves in the surveys when I spoke to them about the challenges that they face in becoming sustainable in, in, in embedding it in their practice. You know, some of them said, yes, sometimes we have to buy things from Amazon because we need it right now and we can't spare the time to source it locally. Sometimes they fail at getting their landlords to switch to a more um, sustainable energy source, but they've tried, but they acknowledge that there are things that they're not doing 
or they can't source materials in the most ethical way because it simply won't work for them at their size, time, place right now. But the point is that they're doing all of those things consciously. And when we start from a place of consciousness, we can create change because we know what we're doing. No more automatic actions. So I, um, I want you to take that number that you put in front of yourselves and I want you to hold it. And then I also want you to be kind to yourselves and to move forward. So I want you to put it just slightly to one side and I want you to think about this graph that's in front of us. And we're going to go on the journey together. I want you to think about where you are now, which is the, your number that you just did. And we're going to travel to where you want to be. So where you want to be is your big picture. What, what would you like it to look like in an ideal world? And you can do this to yourself right now. I would really like you to actively do it, though. Take this time that you've been given right now and make really good use of it. Don't be answering your emails while you're watching because I know that's what some of you are doing because that's what I do as well, we all do. I want you to really take this time and make good use of it. What's your big picture? What's your ambition? Where would you like to be? It might be in five years, it might be in 10 years, it might be in 20 years, but what's that big picture? What does your business look like? Think practically, what are those changes? Are you zero carbon? Are you carbon negative? Are you working in your own retrofit eco building? What's that big picture? I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to sort of really think about that. It'd be interesting if you've got things that you can um, share with the group, but that's up to you. Just going to give you a few minutes. Because we often don't make space and time, I think, to do these things. We want to. Our intentions are good. But there's some planning to be done when we achieve goals, even if they're small ones. I've got some lovely helpers in the background that you can't see that are monitoring the chat and things. So I can't see what you're putting up right now, so I can't respond to anything. But they are paying attention and hopefully responding if you need them to. So think about how you'll know when you've got to your big vision. What will it look like? And I want you, while you're doing it, to accept that, that that is a big journey. It's a big journey to get there. This is a vision. This is an end destination. Don't worry about the hows and the, 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 the whats and the whys and the how you get there. I'm just wanting you to paint that picture. And then when you've got that, when you can see that big picture, you can imagine it like an actual picture. I'm a very visual thinker, so I often, you'll see me gesticulate randomly. I, I often think of things in a very, very visual, practical way. So it might be an actual picture that you have painted on your wall, and this is what you're imagining. But when you've got all of that, I want you to go back to the other end of this, and I want you to take five minutes to identify things that you're already doing at the beginning. What are you doing now? Five things that um, you're already doing in order to try and make your organisation environmentally sustainable. Big things and small things. It could be walk to work. It could be we replaced the water cooler because it wasn't efficient. It could be we do a litter pick every month. Any Anything that you're currently doing in order to help embed that sustainability. My lovely helper just told me how to see your comments if I skip back and out of the screen again. Fantastic. I can see some of these comments now. Brilliant. It would be fantastic if you wanted to share some of those things in the chat that you're already doing, because 
I think one of the things I would like you to take away from today is that inspiration from the examples they give you and from each other, that learning. Sharing learning is absolutely essential and vital in developing new, better ways of doing things. So you might be doing something that seems completely obvious to you, but is revelationary to the person who is virtually next to you. So share that, let them know what else is happening. Just taking a little look at your comments. I see somebody that said that they they struggle to do the sustainability work because they're working in an open office plan. So that's trickier. And it is trickier, but you can still make impact because as I say, it's the little things and they build up. And also people people often are very easily swayed. If you model behavior, they'll pick up on it. So I want you to think about that when you make, make decisions and do things. Think about how children learn. We don't change very much as we get older. We still tend to mimic what we see. Have you all got your list of things? You can't answer me, but I'm hoping that you do. Yeah? Okay, now I want you to think of five things that you could change, but haven't. And don't shut yourself down with this. Don't be thinking, well, I could change my energy supplier, but it's not my property and I'd have to go through the landlord and that would be complicated. Don't do any of the ifs and the buts and the after. Just that change that you could make in order to help you get to that end picture that we painted earlier. Very odd talking to a screen when I can't see people and I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm quite used to doing Zoom workshops now, but usually I can see everybody's faces looking back at me and I can get answers. So it's a little bit um, distracting almost. Have you got things, things that you could change? Oops. Okay, these are useful. I want you to really make use of the time that you're here to think about these things because I want you to go away and take them with you and to do something with them. Yeah. Okay, good. So we're doing a lot of thinking around. We're going to try and put it in a bit of a straight line. So where you want to be, your big picture is at one end. So you've totally achieved all your eco aims and you're running in your perfect way. And that's what we want to look at because what you need to do is to work backwards and forwards, but backwards. So think about what those changes are and then start to pull out what actions need to come in order to get there. Yeah, that allows you to make a plan. So you decide what changes you would like to make. And it's okay for you to be really ambitious about this. It's okay for you to choose something really dramatic. Maybe you rent, um, rent a property in the city centre and your ambition is to have it use solar panels. It's not your property, that's a big ambition, but I want you to, to really put that down in your list, in your plan, you decide. So you're, you're working backwards from this big picture if your big picture is that you want to be zero carbon, what do you need to do to get to that point? Because that's going to help you develop your action plan. So, and then when you've got your nice list of things, that's when you go away and you figure out your prioritized list. So you work out what's achievable because there's no point setting yourself targets that aren't achievable because you'll just end up disheartened, disappointed, and you'll stop trying. So you sit down with your plan and you start putting them in into an order that you know is achievable, that you can work with. Yeah? 
I'm still saying, yeah, like you're going to answer me. So um, you're going to work out that priority list. It's not perfect, but it's going to keep you on target. It's going to keep you working in a, in a singular direction. And it's going to tell you where you need to get help because you cannot do this on your own. You need to reach out and support each other in doing it. So you've got your, your plan, you've got your big picture, which has helped you make a plan, which is making you research and prioritize, which is gonna enable you to take your action, your first steps. And they might seem tiny and they might seem pitiful. I mean, co-working space I know is tricky. Perhaps it's that you decide to replace the coffee filters with reusable ones. And that's your decision and that's your contribution. Or perhaps you decide to put in a second recycling bin to make sure that people are e find it easier. But what are those actions, those small steps that you can take? And when you're doing this, when you're making your plan, I want you to record the changes and I want you to do that so that you can see the impact that you're having. Because when you're making small changes, again, it can be quite easy to get lost and a bit disheartened because you can't see those big impacts and we all love a big impact. So recording them enables you to really see the distance that you've traveled. And that is a vital thing. And in social enterprise, that's something we do in every aspect of our job. We impact record everything because it's important because the ethos of a social enterprise is that they are having a positive impact on the world around them. And we need to be able to see what that impact is so that we know if we're making a difference, what we need to do differently. Do we need to extend a service, repeat a service, change a service? Who are we working with? Where are the spaces for more change, more growth, more development? And you can't do that if you're not recording what you're already doing. So I would highly advocate for anybody doing that at any point in time, um, but for this especially. And that's really what I want you to do. I want you to take out of this session that plan or that will to start that plan. I'm going to talk to you now about some of the enterprises in the city who are already doing things. Just. I think it's useful to see what other people are doing. It's useful for inspiration. And, and I said, there's no bragging in any of this. It's about sharing and learning and inspiring. So hopefully you'll see something in there that resonates with you. So I've ordered these. I've got, I think I've got five for you. Um, and I've ordered them from the most obvious eco impact to the least obvious eco impact. Um, so that you can see how it relates, that you don't have to have your primary business aim as an environmental impact in order to embed sustainability in everything that you do. You really don't. It should be embedded in every one of our everyday lives. And if I can help remove some of the preconceptions and barriers today, then I have spent my hour wisely. So Polonize CIC, um, they, have a primary eco impact. They work inside pollinator conservation and community beekeeping. It's much bigger than that, what they do. Um, they monitor the hives digitally. They use brand new tech and sensors in order to record the information so that they can better understand the pollinators, so that they can better support them in repopulating areas where they're missing. They've been installing hives on rooftops uh, across the city. So they're aiming at building the urban bee population back up because bees are very important, as we all know. How do they do that? They sell wildflower seed packets. Um, they offer a pollination service from the beehives to sort of farmers and florists, etc. They do citizen science projects. Um, they extract the data that I mentioned from their beehives to understand how they can do better. They also sell produce, so they have um, t-shirts. Uh, they do local collaborations for uh, masks, um, water bottles, all, all of the things that we might need that we would call reusable products. They've embedded that in what they do. There's no reason for a beekeeper to sell a water bottle, but actually encouraging people to use reusable water bottles is an important step. So that's what they do. Um, 
I asked all of these organisations what their most unusual or obscure change has been, um, because sometimes we can only see the big ones, can't we? And it's, it's a bit tricky. So Polonise's most unusual one is that they've made the slightly controversial decision to use polyhives, so that's polystyrene hives, rather than wooden hives, which initially seems quite contrary when we're talking about sustainability. But with all the research they've done, the polyhives have a much longer lifespan, they have better thermals, which keep the bees safer, encourage more production, encourage healthier hives. Um, and they went a step beyond that, so the step, the place that they get their polyhives from um, offsets its negative impacts uh, through tree planting projects. And they've worked to find a local recycling plant that they can use when these polyhives do exceed their lifespan. So they won't be just landfilling them. And their next step is to work on creating a local supply for their wildflower seeds, because currently they're um, sourcing them from across the UK and they want to reduce their foot, uh, um, carbon footprint even further so they're looking to build a local collective because it's the little things that matter um, and, and they've all got top tips for you so their top tip is to get an eco audit of your building done so whether you rent or own you can get an eco audit done and what that will do is allow you to work out where you could save energy and reduce your carbon footprint in terms of energy consumption. So Borrow Don't Buy is the next one in our list. Uh, they again have a primary eco impact. Uh, they're a library of things, which I don't know if you're familiar with or not. But um, when I ask them how, how do they achieve their eco aim? They help members save money. Uh, reduce their waste and reduce their carbon footprint by coming and borrowing an item rather than heading out and buying new. Um, that works incredibly well actually. Uh, they, they have a really good example in that when you buy a drill, like a, to drill in your wall, um, most drills are used for approximately 13 minutes in their lifespan. They spend the rest of their time in a cupboard not being used. But of course, every drill that's made demands huge resources in terms of the battery, the plastic, the packaging, the delivery. It's massive. Whereas they have drills in their office that you come, you use, you return, the next person comes, uses, returns. So that product value the value of the equipment itself is truly used to its maximum potential. Um, and they also run repair cafes, which uh, in which they they don't just repair things for people, but they educate people on how to repair their things and extend their lives and save them from landfill. I asked them what their most unusual or obscure change for impact was. Um, and They've chosen to put all of their smaller items, so anything sort of smaller than a strimmer, in reusable and returnable tote bags rather than plastic boxes or carrier bags or any of the other potentially breakable objects that they do. Um, and they are themselves not just standard box standard tote bags as cheap as you can get from Amazon. They are made by an organisation who does it from recycled bottles. They're fully machine washable and they are eco-friendly and COVID safe. So after every um, trip out, every loan, they can come back and they can wash them and they can go through it again, which helps reduce waste. Brilliant. So um, their biggest challenge is sourcing things and parts locally. So because they repair items at the repair cafes, but they also maintain all of the equipment in their library of stuff uh, regularly and they do sometimes really struggle to source things locally they try to use things like facebook marketplace or local traders but it's their challenge so they acknowledge that sometimes they have to step outside their eco comfort zone their next step is to develop a way to measure the co2 of these borrowed items to help empower and encourage people to borrow more um, because a lot of it is, is about that, making people recognise the impact that they're having already. 
which is why I wanted you to identify the things that you're already doing. It's very easy to get caught up in the things that we're not doing. And I really want you to take the time to celebrate the things that you are doing. Um, their top tip for you is to collaborate with other businesses and share resources and learning because otherwise you're wasting materials and time. It's a fairly obvious one for a library of things, I think. Share things. Art and energy are sort of sitting in the middle here for us. So they do not identify themselves as having a, uh, an eco impact as one of their primary impacts. Um, what they do is creative activities to engage people with energy. And it's a bit it's a bit broader than that. It's a very simplified way of explaining what they do, but they create artworks and sculptures that are related to energy production um, as well as consumption. So the pictures you can see behind them here are made of solar panels, um, which they etch, cut and shape. And within all of that, they've done a lot of research about the most efficient uh, surface treatment for solar panels in that way and they've created some large installations for organisations but the activities are primarily designed to make people rethink about the way that they engage with electricity so these pictures behind them actually will charge your phone for you there's a little usb plug in the bottom and you plug it in and you plug your phone and you leave it on the window ledge and you solar charge your phone it's absolutely genius um, they run activities and, and create these artworks to make people think. At the moment, they are part of a huge, I mean, it says on there, a huge mass participation art installation, which will be at COP26 in Glasgow. So they're aiming to create, if I remember rightly, it's 20,000 uh, recycled plastic moths, which will be decorated and hung in a huge UV light installation as part of the COP26, um, I'm gonna call them celebrations. Uh, so they're inviting people to make them at home, they're doing Zoom workshops. Um, and yeah, so it's all recycled. They've got kits that they're giving out to schools that will then take, come back and go to the next place. So although they don't physically themselves have an impact, it's embedded in how they work and what they do. Their biggest challenge is, and I've put this as a direct quote of what they wrote, but that everything has an impact. So theoret theoretically, we shouldn't do anything, but we have to do something. And I know I mentioned this a minute ago. It's it's an ongoing issue, this, this panic of like, I'm not doing enough, I should bother. It wears you down and knowing what to do for the right. And I think that doing something is always better than doing nothing. So when you get those moments and you get a bit wrapped up, I want you to just remember baby steps are still steps. They're still taking you somewhere. Um, and that was their top tip as well. It was to work as a collective to find other organisations because when you get paralysed by eco-anxieties, it's rare that it happens simultaneously with everybody. So you're able to support each other back out of that, that spiral and get moving again. Um, the next one on our list is Bike Space Cargo. Um, so Bike Space Cargo is a spin-off of Bike Space itself. Uh, they Bike Space is a repair bike shop. So they take in secondhand bikes and they repair them and sell them onto the community and they run workshops for um young people primarily who have faced challenges or difficulties and they teach them how to repair their bikes. Uh, which is a wonderful thing. Um, Bike Space Cargo has come out of that. Um, Bike Space Cargo is a delivery service in the city where they use electric bikes to take people's parcels from one place to another. And I don't know if you can tell from this photo, but they can actually carry an awful lot in those things. I've seen two adults fit in there. So it's quite big. Um, so they are low carbon, obviously, uh, and that's integral to who they are and what they do. They think about it when they're talking about transporting things. They think about it in where the bikes come from. They think about it in who they're working with. Um, 
their most unusual change for impact is actually the cargo bikes themselves. Because if you're running a delivery service, usually you would choose a van. I mean, Plymouth is a small city, but it's still a city. It's quite a distance from the top to the bottom. So they're choosing to use these and they're, they're electric bikes. And that is their biggest challenge is to find this renewable energy source with which to power those bikes and to make sure that they're having as minimal impact on the world as they can. Um, and they acknowledge that. They acknowledge that's a challenge and it's not one they've overcome yet. They are still working on it because that's in their plan. That was in their big picture and it was in their initial list. And it was in their steps when they did their research and they know that there is more work to be done around that. Their next step was actually a massive ambition. Um, so they said that they were going to be overhauling the logistics industry towards zero emissions. And good for them, because if every small organisation had an aim that big and you stand together, that's a much louder voice. And their top tip was simply that you should use them for your deliveries, which I wholeheartedly agree with, and not just because they're a social enterprise. It's very hard not talking to you all. Um, I'd also now like to introduce you to Photo Now CIC. They do not have a primary impact, um, eco impact. They do media production, say films, photography, exhibitions, etc and community projects, so bringing people from uh, that maybe wouldn't usually engage with those mediums in to do workshops and training and create their own exhibitions. They do a lot of fantastic work with uh, refugees and displaced communities, uh, and you may have seen their Campa Obscura around the city over the last, oh, maybe eight years. Um, which is a camper van with a very special camera on the top, uh, which they take out and about to events. They're a great organisation. They have a really robust model of film production, which is obviously a paid service that runs alongside the social impact that they have. Uh, oh, I put the wrong words on there. Sorry about that. Um, so I've told you how they do it. Um, they made a very deliberate decision a couple of years ago to declare their climate emergency and they did it in a very thorough way. So they have spent a lot of time and energy on that plan that we talked about and on working out what that will look like and how they make those changes. So one of the things that they've done is to buy these electric bikes. Um, so now when they travel locally within the city, to uh, events or jobs they use the electric bikes they also have made statements and steps to help all of their team get to work using um, either feet <laughs> or uh, uh, public service vehicles rather than driving um, and they have spent time lobbying their own landlord into using a more renewable energy source they again acknowledge they haven't been able to do that yet. They haven't been able to talk them into it, but they're still trying. And they're also investigating future plans um, for a retrofit eco building where they'll be able to control their environmental impact. Um, their biggest challenge right now is the scope three emissions, which are connected to the tech that they have to use because there's not much you can do. If you need a video camera, you need a video camera. It's going to be made of the materials that it's going to be made of. But they are looking at better ways to do it. So they buy secondhand where they can. They um, use kit over and over again. They are investigating these scope three emissions and they are trying to find ways to, to find out. They've said that the emissions from the kit suppliers are effectively untraceable. And if you're not familiar with the scopes, um, there's scope one, two, and three emissions. Uh, so one is say fuel combustion, company vehicles, um, fugitive emissions, which more or less means leaks. So they're quite big things that you may or may not be in control of. Um, scope two is your purchased energy. Again, they're having a trouble with scope two because they have a landlord um, 
And scope three is basically everything else. So it includes purchase goods and services, business travel, employee commuting, your waste disposal systems, um, uh, sold products, transportation of those products, uh, a distribution both up and downstream. Um, also your investments. So for instance, where's your company pension going? Um, leased assets and franchises so it's basically everything else but also it's basically all of the things that you can control so scope three is a great place for you to start as a small to medium enterprise because you might not be able to impact the others so much but by focusing on those tiny changes you can have huge impacts um, and their top tip was to declare a climate emergency create that plan and action your plan um, and and it's doable. It's very, very doable. Um, Moments Cafe is the last one that I'm going to talk to you about today. So they do not have a primary eco impact. They are a cafe situated in the city centre and up says they have a hub that supports people who are living with dementia or living with people who live with dementia. They run this community cafe that is dementia friendly in itself um, and it's a wonderful place. If you haven't been there, please do go and visit them. Uh, they do great food, incredibly friendly team, really nice place to go and have a cup of coffee and you know that you're doing something good in the world. Um, they really struggled with this question and I'm sure they won't mind me telling you because the eco impact is not primary to them. It's not at the forefront of the way that they think they had to work very hard to answer my questions about what they were doing but when they did they realized how much they actually do i mean the graphic here is theirs and there are six changes on there that are very very achievable for an organization of the size working with food that have massive environmental impacts on how sustainable their business is on how sustainable their positive impacts are environmentally. So they use locally sourced products because carbon footprint. They use Rainforest Alliance coffee because then you know that you're not making anything any worse. They work with zero waste to landfill. Um, a really interesting one that they do is that they review their menu in order specifically to reduce food waste. So rather than just always having what they have, they use their specials boards and their changeable things to make sure that they're not wasting food. Um, and then they give away their coffee grounds. They preside, provide recyclable coffee cups and takeaway containers rather than just using your bog standard wax, waxed paper. So many people think it's a paper cup, therefore it's environmentally friendly, but I'm sure we all know that is not true. Spending a little bit of time doing the research can dramatically reduce the amount of waste that, that they make and has. Um, so their most unusual change was this, this program that they use, um, which makes sure all of that their produce is locally sourced. So it's actually an app that they have bought into, which when they order, makes sure that it has the lowest distance traveled possible for them. And their biggest challenge is that they are in a very large, very old building in the middle of the city centre. Their landlord lives in, I think it, it's the Middle East, so he's quite hard to get hold of. Um, and their energy efficiency is just really difficult. They have an open fronted building and it's big and it's airy. And like every other building in Plymouth, it's got a bit of damp at the top somewhere. So they really struggle with that. So, but they understand that that's a challenge and that they can't solve it right now. So they do everything that they can do. They make the changes that are within their power. Their next step is just to keep doing what they're doing. They, they, they are happy with the distance that they're moving in. Um, and I expect feeling a little refreshed having had that time to reflect on the impacts that they are already having. Um, which is again, I'm gonna say it again because I want you to do the same thing. I want you to take the time to recognize the impacts that you're having as you're doing it. 
And their top tip is to reduce your food waste. So review your menus on a regular basis. And you can do that at home too. Check your fridge, make sure you rotate your food. I know that I'm terrible for that. I definitely think I'm going to eat that spinach and I never eat that spinach. So uh, I have to learn to be better just like everybody else does. So I would, I've given you lots of information. I've also asked you to do quite a lot of thinking. Um, and I would really like to know what you're going to do next. There are a few suggestions here. Uh, they're not all of them. Um, I've got everything from huge things to just having a cup of tea because it might be too much. So you might just want to go and have a cup of tea. Um, but I would really love it if you could pop something in the discussion about what you're going to do next as you come away from this workshop is there something that you're going to take away with you in order to help you get started on your journey to becoming more sustainable and it can be big and it can be small and it's okay i've got some help pages and resources that I can give you. Um, uh, my lovely assistant is going to pop them in the chat for me. Um, that can give you a place to get started. Uh, you can just have a chat with your team. Maybe they're doing things you don't know about. Maybe there are already things in place that you don't realise you're doing. Um, you could paint your giant picture uh, physically, verbally, literally, however it is that you want to do it. Do an audit. That's a really, really useful thing to do. So actually sit down, take a long, hard look at everything that you are doing, record like a, like a regular audit. It's like, okay, where's my energy coming from? What does that look like? Where's my waste? How much is that? How Everything that you're doing, because if you can't see it clearly, you can't possibly hope to make a change. I'm a big fan of putting everything in a straight line so that you can see what comes next. So maybe you'll do an audit. Maybe you'll contact some of the businesses I've spoken to you about today. Ask them what they're doing, how they're doing it. Do they have any advice? Maybe a partnership. Maybe there's a way that you could relate and interact with each other in order to have positive impact. Maybe you're even thinking that perhaps the business that you run could have a primary eco impact if you just thought about it a little bit because we all know that the ethical consumer market is growing daily people now care about how they're spending their money and what they're spending their money on they want to know that the decisions they make are not damaging the world around them and are doing some good so it's good for the people, it's good for the planet, it's good for your business. Maybe there is space for an eco purpose in what you do. Are you just going to set an ambition, a single thought, of this is what I want? What are you going to do next? These are uh, the things I want you to take away today because, as I said at the beginning, I feel like things should be simple. They should be achievable and not overcomplicated. I've broken it down to four. I want you to audit what you're doing. You are more than likely doing more than you think you are, and it will help you be clear about the changes. And audit regularly. Don't just do it once and park it in a corner. Revisit it. Reflect. Adapt. Don't get overwhelmed. You cannot fix everything at once and nobody in the world is expecting you to. There's that great saying that we need um, everyone doing zero waste badly, don't we? Rather than nobody doing it, rather than one person doing it well, we need everybody doing it badly because it's, it's group impact. We're all doing a little bit and that matters. Um, I want you to think about whether or not you can make sustainability integral to your offer. So is there something about your sustainability that could become a key part of your product or service? Is there a way that you can make it so integral that it can't possibly fall off the radar later when you get busy? And I want you to take a look at all the help and advice out there because there are organisations who can help you through the whole process. And there are um, 
lots of free resources out there that you can access as well. And, and really, really, really importantly, talk to other people because a conversation with another person doing something similar is just as valuable as a great big expensive service from, um, from an organization. You just have to learn, be open, talk, share, that is key. These are a few of the resources that I mentioned. So Catherine's going to pop them in the, the chat for you. So Greener Energy Futures and Sustainable Sidekicks, they both provide services that take you all the way from um, developing your plan, auditing, um, accessing funding, sort of finding what funding there can be out there that will help you and your organisation take the next steps towards sustainability. They do consultancy on short term and long term and will help you develop that strategy that we talked about. If you don't have the money knocking about in your coffers to do that, then come and visit the Plymouth Social Enterprise Network uh, website. We've got a climate emergency toolkit, which is laid out in an easy to use way so that you can take yourself through the journey of declaring your climate emergency and then also give you the tools you need to do that audit and to start reflecting to make those changes. Climate Emergency UK is absolutely packed with useful resources um, about what, how to do it, where to look, demystifying, de-jargoning things, and the Carbon Trust as well. I highly recommend that you take a look at the Carbon Trust the four ways to reduce your carbon impact on the world around you. And what you're doing and that is me um i'm going to stop sharing and in theory you should be able to see me again um and yeah that's that's me for today if you do have any questions or uh, anything else you're quite welcome to get in touch with me or i'll be hanging around in the chat feeds afterwards for a little while excellent many thanks jess that was really, um, yeah, really fascinating, and, and I think some real clarity on on steps that can be taken um, within organisations. I don't know if people have. We have got a few minutes left if people wanted to pose any questions in the in the Q and A. If you're willing, just to mm -hmm. just to have a, let's let's see if anything pops up. I actually had a question myself um, in the interim. I'm quite interested in the you know the small changes adding up to big impacts. Of course, is crucial here, and the sort of the motivational side of. It, you talked about how the audit can sort of be a win-win in terms of you know, seeing what, what not only planning what you're going to do, but also then thinking about the success, and that can be quite motivational and kind of snowball effect. I wonder whether, as a as an organisation sort of spanning as a network organisation, whether you'd undertaken any work to sort of integrate those audits from across your network, and somehow you could you could almost show that you could show that collective larger impact if, if you were able to integrate across your network. And I wonder whether that would then also act as a sort of a magnet to bringing more organizations on board. That's is, a really is that something question. that you're doing? Yeah, we haven't done that, I'll be honest. Um, but that is a really good question. And actually, I, I like the idea. It would be quite easy to implement. And yeah, very inspiring. I think I think for all of us, the key is to keep talking because when we can mm -hmm. see things, we can, they feel more achievable. It's very hard to do everything yeah. on your own. And a lot of social enterprises and solo entrepreneurs do everything on their own and it can be a bit overwhelming. So um, I'm definitely going to take that back to the board mm -hmm. as, as an action, perhaps for this year coming out of the conference. I think that's a nice one for us. Uh, yeah, good. I think so, as a natural scientist, I'm always... I'm always looking for evidence for things. And I think that's, you know, I think changing behavior is, you know, I, I, I work, do work with social scientists and I, I do understand sort of the qualitative evidence side, but I think sometimes you think actually we could collectively look at all those behaviors across the piece. And there are tools out there, aren't there, where you could actually say, oh, let's see if we can turn that into a carbon measure. You know, can we turn that into, and it'd be quite interesting just to see that. And you could actually show how that grows through time as well. It'd be, and, and then, you know, like I say, then it might just bring people, Bring other organisations in, so that's that's really interesting. I think it's fantastic work. I think this kind of integrating network kind of activity is so important. You know, like you say, to sort of to, to, to bring people together, share best practice. So thank you, really appreciate that. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me here today.
Yeah, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. So I'm looking, look, just looking at the chat. I can't see any more questions coming in at the moment. I think we're we're approaching maybe a good time to give people a, a rest from the screens before. A little bit of, right. of the day. Yeah. yeah. It was lovely. So, it, uh, yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say thank you again. Brilliant. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I think, again, if we can bring some of these things across to the discussion area, there will be a, there will be a discussion zone for for this topic. So I think, um, yeah, please do post things in there. And, and Jess, I'm sure you can check into that and follow up on anything that comes up. And again, thank you for those links as well. I think that's really useful for people. And we've seen comments alongside where people have, have indicated they're really keen to follow those things up. So so yes. many thanks indeed for your, for your contribution today and um, look forward to seeing you again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Thank you.